Mm. Hi everybody, hi everybody, this is Christian, this is Laziness Academy, and this is a very, very special celebratory video. Today uh, we are going to celebrate, I am going to celebrate 14,000 subscribers. We are above 14,000 subscribers, 14,400, 600, some, something along these lines um, is the number that we reached. And I'm very happy about that, that was kind of like a milestone to, for 2023 and I'm happy that we achieved this. The reason why 14,000 subscribers is that uh, previously, I was uh, working on a channel called um, Teamwork Cast, and that is the channel that uh, we started our, the breakout tutorial on, and that channel had around 14,400 subscribers. Um, I kind of stopped working on that, we kind of like disbanded a little bit. Um, but it's nice that this new channel that, that I created uh, now has more subscribers than that previous channel, so that, that feels very satisfying and good, and I'm happy about that. Yes, so um, today we're going to answer some of your questions. You sent me some beautiful questions, and I want to answer them. But maybe I want to start with something else. So one of the things that I recently did is like a hardware review video of the RGB 30 uh, from PowKitty, this thing here. And I, during that, during the recording of that video, I had to like get out all of the hardware that I had in my drawer. And I want to give you maybe like long-term impressions of the other things that I have. Some of these things I already reviewed. Some of these things just came up in the videos and, <laughs> you know, kind of like a drive-by fashion. Um, so let me just give you an overview of the kind of stuff that I have here. Obviously, we have to talk about the pocket chip, a uh, really, really cool device. That's the kind of the thing that started out my uh, passion with Pico 8. Um, sadly, I'm not actually using the pocket chip that much anymore. Um, two big problems with the pocket chip is that it is very slow. It boots for ages and it doesn't run Pico 8 very fast. And the keyboard is also really, really bad. Uh, so you kind of really can only really, really use the pocket chip with a, like an external keyboard. I used to have like a Bluetooth keyboard. I was actually doing some coding on a pocket chip. Uh, so I had an external Bluetooth keyboard for that. I lost that keyboard. And so the pocket chip is no longer as useful. And now I have some other devices as well. So the pocket chip is more of a, like an emotional <laughs> support <laughs> device at this point, if you know what I'm saying. I also have this one. This is the Clockwork Pi Game Shell. That is the first device that I reviewed. That's the first handheld that I had that was playing Pico 8. I still love it, actually. Like, I, okay, I'm not using it. I'm not playing it. It's it, The screen is too small and it's bad. And it boots, like the boot time is crazy. And there's some other little nitpicks that I don't like about it. But every time I get it out for one of the videos, I realize how 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 nice it feels. Like it's very sturdy and the plastic is really nice to, like it has a really nice feel. I, I would love Clockwork Pi to just bring out an updated version of that. Just like a really nice big screen, same build quality, maybe something that boots faster. I would love to do that because this is this is this is such a pleasure every time to get out. I don't know. Okay, so another device that I reviewed was this one. This is the um, Game Force, um, the Qi Game Force. Um, it was my previous recommended Pico 8 device. Um, I'm not using it that much anymore because now I have a lot of follow-up devices, but I played a lot Pico 8 on this and other stuff as well. I still think it's really good. One problem that I wanted to mention is that uh, the battery on this thing died that I just noticed when I recorded the most recent video. I tried to t turn it on and it, the battery just completely doesn't work anymore. Like it doesn't even boot up. I have to plug it in and then it boots up. You can tell in the video. I have to probably unscrew this and get the battery out because it might explode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, I think it's still still great. Um, something I noticed now compared to the more modern devices is that the screen, it's not bad, but you can tell that the more, more modern screens, the laminated screens are just, it's just a tiny little bit better. Um, there's a little bit of dust underneath the glass here now, so um, it, it aged a little bit, but um, there is some little details about this device that I still like, which is one of the th um, things that I like is this dedicated menu button uh, so pressing this and some other buttons will like exit into the main menu and so forth or change the volume and some other devices that we're going to see today they don't have that and i miss that that's actually really good that makes the entire device seal, seem a lot more polished all right so this device i, I haven't reviewed this uh, this is the embernic 351p uh, I bought it at, on a whim at some point because I, I kind of like it. I like the, the GameCube or like the Game Boy Advance kind of colors. And every time I get it out, I'm amazed how small it is. You know, it's as wide as the other horizontal devices, but it's just like a little bit not as tall. And that makes it a, little, a lot more compact for some reason. Also really good build quality by Embernic. This feels like incredibly solid. 
not as good as the game shell, but but still very, very solid. Uh, one thing I want to note about this device is that during the testing on my most recent video, that was the only device that actually, where the D-pad actually uh, had no no uh, false diagonals. By just pressing down and wiggling my finger, I couldn't trigger a um, false diagonal that way. So that is technically a very good D-pad, but actually also I don't like the D-pad on this one for some reason. I don't know, it feels a bit stiff and uh, the individual arms of the D-pad are just a little bit too thin to my, for my taste. So even though it's technically the best D-pad, uh, subjectively I don't like this very much. I'm not playing this too much because there's other devices there, but I, I, I just, it was just like an impulse purchase. I have to say, like, being in China, it's very easy to buy those devices because they're incredibly cheap in China. <laughs> so I was like, hey, let's try. All right, so this is the big one. This is, you might not recognize what it is. This is the dev term. <laughs> yes, the dev term. I wanted to actually do a follow-up video on a game shell because there's a bunch of things I didn't quite get right in my review and I wanted to do like a follow-up and, and research them a little bit and, and give you a bit of a follow-up. Um, insights about some of the things I said about the dev term. Um, one major thing I got wrong is that the um, video out actually does work. I just had the wrong cable. With the right kind of cable, you can get the video out to work. That's kind of like on me. I did a post that a pinned comment underneath that review to clarify this. I tried to get to the bottom of the, there's some stickers on there I put there and there. I tried to get to the bottom of the problem with the flap. I don't understand what the problem is. I actually went ahead and 3, 3D printed um, replacement battery flaps from the 3D models provided by, by GameShell, um, by Clockwork Pi. They have some 3D models on the website of the, of the entire enclosure. So I 3D printed a bunch of those. Uh, I even went ahead and actually modded them a little bit because um, there was the theory that maybe the batteries are too big and that they push out the battery flap and that's why it gets so easily <laughs> gets gets removed. Um, but um, so I made them a little bit, you know, a little bit thicker, uh, but that didn't solve my battery flap problem. I don't know what the problem is. Uh, it's Maybe it's just, it's the shell that's the problem. Actually, I would maybe need a different shell. I don't know. There's also new drivers for the trackballs that I wanted to try, but it's, not, it's a whole procedure to get them installed. And I don't think it's, it's a radical change. So yeah, and there's some things that didn't change, like the D-pads. There's nothing about the D-pad that you can do. It's just so horrible. Also, I've 3D printed this. And that was initially, I thought that was like one of the major game changers. They provided like um, 3D printing data to, um, to create like this protective cover that goes on top of the dev term and then you can toss it in your backpack that would be actually a big deal sadly it's just 3d printed data it's not actually a thing that you can buy from them i 3d printed this at a kind of like a resin 3d print at a factory in china and um <laughs> hmm. the problem with 3d printing is at the beginning it was really great but then it, the 3D prints, like the, the cover kind of like became loose a little bit. And so now now it's just like on there. It's just, it just falls off without me having to do anything. It's, there's also a crack in there as well. And it got old, got old yellow. It was white, like the translucent white at the beginning. But now it's all yellowish, so it doesn't look as nice anymore. So I did research some of the things about, about my review, but they were quite often turned out to be a dead end. And I don't know. Um, and now there's like a new console by the Clockwork Pi. Uh, the U console, which I'm actually more interested in discussing. Maybe I will do like a little s side note when I get to play around with the U console. But no, still, this is my Linux machine now. <laughs> As you saw in the video, whenever I have to do something in Linux, <laughs> that's the machine I will use. It's still working. I really love that it has the replaceable batteries. That makes it really easy to just put it in storage and don't care about the batteries leaking or something like this. Now this is one of the devices that I did not discuss. Uh, it comes up in the videos. <laughs> it's the Ambernic 351V. And this one has, um, and this was like a spontaneous purchase at like, like literally one week or two weeks before we left China. I want to take advantage of the fact that we still can get those devices very cheaply. And I wanted to just have maybe something as an, a slightly upgraded Game Force because it's essentially the Game Force. It's the same hardware as Game Force, same resolution screen, the same chip, and so forth. Uh, it, the screen is just a little bit nicer because it's a laminated screen, so it's a little bit nicer, different form factor, obviously, and the wooden the wooden texture is is. Mm. <laughs> 
that's the, that's the, that's a that's the thing that pushed me over the edge because it's just so such a such a weird looking device. It's like a wooden Game Boy. I love it. I did play it a little bit. The problem I have with this one compared to the Game Force is that it doesn't have like a dedicated menu button. You everything you do is you do with select and another button, and that sometimes triggers something in the game. There is a dedicated button in the center here, but for some reason that's not being used by the OS. I don't know what's happening there. Uh, it's just the Game Force just feels a little bit more polished in its usability in the way the OS is integrated with the hardware. Um, but this is definitely better build quality, I would say. Now, the Mio Mini, I talked a lot about the Mio Mini, not, <laughs> not the great greatest device to play Pico 8 on. But for everything else, it's great. It used to be a device that, it still is, a device that basically lives in my backpack. It, I just put it in there and whenever... I accidentally get into a situation where I get bored. I can always whip this out and play this. I played a bunch of stuff on this. I actually played through Super Mario World on this, like completely 100% Super Mario World, like with all the special stages and so forth. So yeah, that was really good. I still use it and I will continue using it until this dies. And yeah, the RGB30 now becomes my go-to uh, Pico 8 device. I still want to keep the Game Force running. I want to replace the batteries on that one. Uh, something I also showed in the video that is not Pico 8 related. So this is a heavily modded Game Boy Advance. It's an original Game Boy Advance with a new shell, new buttons, and a new screen. Uh, and it has been provided like I bought it from um, a place called Digital Gaming Heaven, which is a place in the UK, a shop in the UK that uh, sells these. The cool thing about this, it has an HDMI out. Um, so you can play, you can technically use it as a kind of like a switch. It has a docking station even, so you can put it in a docking station and play it on a TV. You can put it in a uh, Super Nintendo controller to docking station and play it <laughs> like that. I use this for speedrunning for a little bit. Uh, I will say the video out on this one is not as great. It, it's only like a 480p video out on the website. It says 720p, but it's only 480. And that doesn't work really well with scaling on modern TVs. So uh, in the end, you know, the video out wasn't that important, but it's still really good to play some old um, Game Boy games because if you know, the original screen of the GBA is is horrible. And uh, so that's, you know, that upgrade, upgrading the screen to be like a more modern, brighter screen is really a big deal. And I want to also maybe give you like a tease of a, not a device that I wanted to review, but I never did. And I don't know if I'm going to ever review it, but there is this thing here called the Minbei. I wanted to review this because they did an advertisement for this and it actually, the advertisement had Pico 8 in it. Um, so the Minbei is kind of like a little iPad kind of device where you can do pixel art on it, uh, which is a great idea. Let down by the fact that the touch screen is horrible. It's very imprecise. You can't hit the pixels that you want. And also the colors are hardwired. You cannot change the color palette and the color palette it ships with is atrocious. <laughs> it's really bad. The colors are bad. Like I can do more with the 16 colors of Pico 8 than with these 128 colors. So I probably, I'm not sure if I'm going to do a re review of this. Maybe at some point in the future, but now I kind of like lost my, my will to, to do a review of this because it's just bad. Let us discuss some of the questions. You sent me some amazing questions. I wanted to answer them. I'm not sure if I'm going to get through all of them today, but I'm going to try. Um, so uh, Triangle asked, or Tringle? Tringle asked, how do you start off, uh, did you start off programming and why did you stick with Pico 8 specifically? And there's some other people that ask similar questions. Luffy Games also asked, um, why do you use Pico 8 and what career you do you study? Tom asked, how did you get into Pico 8 and what's some other coding things that you've done? RetroPixie also asked, I would uh, like to know some uh, of your more of your past as a game dev. When did you start? Why, which, which game engine or what made you switch to Pico 8? Um, so in programming languages, when I was a kid in school, I started out with BASIC on the Atari 130XE. I graduated in high school to Visual BASIC on Windows 95, I guess. Uh, and that was amazing because Visual Basic allowed you to just create like actual Windows applications, which was pretty, felt, it felt pretty powerful. And I did some games on this as well. Um, then uh, during studies, I kind of like did a lot of Flash stuff uh, because web development was a big deal. Um, and also Flash taught me a lot about motion design and so forth. Um, and then afterwards, I basically went to Pico 8. I did some, I dabbled a little bit in Unity. Um, I did some, a little bit Game Maker. Uh, also, I learned um, processing as well because I'm teaching a processing course. I studied uh, design, just design here on in, uh, in Cologne at a place called uh, Cologne International School of Design. 
Next question by Otto M. Mushman. What games have influenced your opinions on game development and game design at most? Oh man, that's a that's a tricky question. Um, I uh, like every because every game I play, I get something out of it. So it's kind of difficult to to like single out one game, you know. Um, I would say that maybe uh, if there is one that I would like to like, I find myself returning to over and over again. That would be probably Into the Breach um, because it has some. It does some really radical things about that specific genre, and I'm thinking a lot about strategy games and so forth. I like to play strategy games, and Into the Breach um, kind of like do, did some radical design choices in that space, such as, for example, it's a strategy game, like a tactics game, that doesn't have any random number generation, and that to me, that's wow, that's important. Um, it also introduced like this thing that you get uh, became kind of like a design trend now that you can see a preview of what's going to happen. So re you're reacting to the future. I think that's a big deal. Uh, and it also like it has this one thing where it has run random number generation, but only if you get hit. It's it's complicated. It's like very specific moment where you're about to die. There's a chance that you won't die. And uh, I think that's smart. Again, that's smart in a game that is completely deterministic um, because. Uh, if it's completely de deterministic, then you might be in a situation where that is completely unwinnable. And then if you know that you're not that you're going to die, then you might not play out the game un to the end. But if there is one non-deterministic aspect of it, you might survive, then you might uh, play the odds. I like it. I think about it a lot. I might uh, do a video about this because I have lots of thoughts about this specific game. Um, also, some other things that some other games that have really captured my imaginations are the games, the board games. The board games by a guy called Cole Whirl. So um, games like Root, Oath, uh, John Company, and Pax Pamir. These are games that I'm really enjoying. I think uh, Cole Whirl is a fantastic board game designer, and I'm still wrapping my head around. A lot of the decisions as he does in board game design, amazing stuff. Loki Striker asks, "What do you consider your biggest breakthrough during your journey as a game developer? It doesn't have to be the, big, the biggest, but a notable one you recall. This can be also relative to your own journey." Oh, whew. that's that's a tough question. There's lots of things that happened. <laughs> um, I would say that. Um, there's a one memorable moment I noticed that I remember very well, and that was shortly before I began my studies when I read a book called uh, Play uh, by Eric Zimmerman and Katie Salem. The Play of Games. Is it the Play of Games? Oh my gosh, what's the name of the book? <laughs> Rules of Play. And then <laughs> the book is called Rules of Play. I still have it in my um, in my shelf. I, it's, it's still packaged. I haven't unpacked it yet. Um, but yeah, it's a really great book. I would recommend it. And one thing I, that is amazing about that book is that they, um, I, when I was reading it, I noticed they they, they were um, discussing a lot of different games with like this this respect and passion for the, them, even though the games were sometimes not that great, you know. And um, I was quite young at that point, you know, like barely out of high school. And I was still in this kind of gamer mindset where I was very opinionated about my tastes, you know, like, oh, this is a good game and this is a bad game. Ugh. You know, like this kind of rage gamer kind of mentality. Uh, and so reading somebody uh, speaking in this kind of very respectful tone about games that I would consider inferior uh, really recalibrated my mindset when it comes to what, how you have to think about games when you are a game designer. I think a game designer is somebody who really has a certain passion and appreciation for games, no matter whether they um, appeal to their taste or not. Or maybe to put it different, their taste is a lot more open and more inclusive of very different types of games. So it's not about, oh, this game is great and this game is horrible, but it's more about, you know, I love game, gaming in general. I appreciate all types of play. And instead of rationalizing why this is good and why this is bad, it's more about what is there about this specific game that people appreciate, you know, understanding create like an empathy for um, people who enjoy things that you might not necessarily enjoy yourself and having like this kind of very wholesome and like appreciation for gaming and playing in general that it goes beyond your own taste horizon. I thought that was a that was like this kind of like mind blown uh, a third eye opening moment for me that I remember. Gunk Lemon Lust Valentine asked what was your most difficult programming problem? Ooh, uh, hard to say. 
Um, usually the, the hard programming problems are so hard that you don't never finish it and then you never think about it. Uh, I don't know. Um, I remember there's one thing I remember from, I think I worked on, um, trauma, my, the game that I released on steam back, uh, after my studies, I remember there was a specific bug that was <laughs> really like, just, just like soul crushing, uh, because it was almost, the game was almost finished. I was kind of like wrapping up and then I encountered a bug where, it was very difficult to reproduce. And one of the reasons why it was difficult to reproduce is that in the development environment, um, I made the game in Flash. Now, when I launched Flash and ran again the game in Flash, it, it ran perfectly well. But then when I exported this to like a standalone version that I would distribute, um, kind of like executable version, that version had some kind of bug. And I like I could not reproduce that bug when, I, when it ran into the debug environment. So the game would crash but if i debug it the crash wouldn't happen <laughs> so it's like uh, it was very difficult to find out what the problem is uh, it turns out at the end that it was a um, timing issue that you know when you run it in debug mode it the run the game run a little bit slower so certain events happened in a certain order but when you exported it the game ran so much faster so the events the event order changed and that caused some problems. And I, like you, it, there was just no way for me to, like, it was so hard. It, I, it took a bunch of days and a lot of hair <laughs> to find that problem. And uh, there was an initial problem that the actual bug, even if, when I got down to the problem, the actual bug actually didn't happen in my code. It happened in the engine's code. So uh, even when I finally nailed down the problem, I still couldn't see what the problem is because the location at which the problem occurs is not something that is viewable in the editor. <laughs> And it was like this kind of really cryptic error message. And man, I, I've almost, like, I felt like the universe is conspiring against me releasing that game. That was, that was soul crushing. <laughs> DJ Clemmer asks, um, your most recent hardware review video is really fun from a production standpoint. And thinking back to everyone's a beginner video, it also felt like you were really able to stretch your legs during that production. The tutorial series are very consistent in their look and feel, which is great for, uh, which is a great feature in itself. A question is besides the known tutorial con content itself, do you enjoy non-standard videos where you can stretch your legs creatively as you've done in the examples listed above? Um, <laughs> I, I love having made them. I don't quite enjoy making them, I have to say. I mean, I have a need to make them. I, I like the everyone's a beginner video. It was something I really have to get uh, off my chest. Um, uh, the problem I have with them, there's just like two problems. First is like I'm, I'm not programming while while making them. I'm not working on on my my games, and um, it's kind of like a, this conflict where I want to make videos, but I want to make videos that support my work on games. I don't want to make videos as my full time job, you know, as and then nothing else. And uh, yeah, that's quite often in conflict with each other, kind of like the opposite problem that Mark Brown for Game Maker's Toolkit has, where he makes those videos about games and that's his job, so to speak. But then he had like this project where he made a platformer, right? He made a game. And you, you could tell that there, it, there was a conflict there because he had to spend so much time on the game, but then he couldn't make videos and then he had to make videos about the game, but that also kind of like <laughs> was eating into the time that he had available for the game. And he talks a little bit about this in the videos. Um, and yeah, somebody like Mark Brown probably wants to come out at the end on in favor of making videos. Uh, I want to come out in favor of making games. Uh, and yeah, so like every time I do like a hardware review or like a, like a special video, that's always um, at the expense of working on games. And that stresses me out to no end. Also, uh, those videos are often, I don't have like the production pipeline to get them out like i think like if you have like a, a video channel that focuses very much on like you know documentary style content they have maybe some kind of like more of a method a production schedule and so forth and maybe like like the setup right so for example um russ from retro gaming corps uh, retro game corps he probably has like some kind of camera setup and light setup so he can quickly whip out a review of a handheld device because that's all he does all the time and I don't have that. So every time I do a hardware review, I have to rebuild that setup from scratch. <laughs> and that just takes time. So yeah, I don't know. I, I come off very negatively. I do like the videos. I will continue making those videos. Don't get me wrong. It's just I'm, I always end up very stressed making those videos somehow. 
Marina Max asks the, the Marina Max asks really amazing questions and, and really like uh, uh, very open questions. What is game development to you? What are games to you? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, game development is like if you're asking for a definition, then game development is making games. That's it. <laughs> Uh, games. What are games? Is is tough. It's a tough question. Um, I think there's a bunch of definitions that I kind of like. Uh, one is that uh, games are basically how people learn. Um, I think there was this, this, this definition that I liked. Um, gaming is learning in a safe space or in a safe environment. Um, I think that's 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 a cool definition because games are quite often like these removed uh, things that we do removed from real life, and then we do experiments and. Uh, practice certain types of thinking in this kind of like removed environment doesn't have any repercussions for um, for the rest of our lives uh, unless we set them up to be meaningful. Um, so that's kind of like one cool, interesting definition. Another definition would be kind of like the uh, Homo Ludens definition kind of thing, where it's like games are kind of like broadly speaking reflect the way people think about the world. We kind of like collapse like humans try to make sense of the chaotic world around us and we collapse things into rules and and like goals like like desires to achieve desirable things to achieve and so forth um our society is uh, governed by rules now we, together we decided that we uh, um you know act according to these rules and that's that's what we consider fair and so forth um for example uh, economy also works according to certain rules and there's like values that <laughs> rise and fall and so forth. And mathematics is also kind of like a system of rules that, we, that humans invented. So like the philosophical insight is that the games share a lot of qualities with a lot of things in our life uh, and might be a, just a general way in which humans make sense of the world. And not just humans. Like, I mean, there's also animals play too, right? Dogs also play. So I mean, maybe not games, but they play, right? So uh, yeah, yeah. Louis Chapman asks, uh, what are some of your favorite albums? Now, that's a question. Um, I have prepared a list. Here are five, five, five albums. Five albums. Uh, Discovery by Daft Punk. The Big Calm by Morchiba. Details by Fru Fru. The relevant artist is Imogen Heap here. Um, Ghost in a Shell original soundtrack by Yoko Kano. And This Binary Universe by BT. So all of these are artists that I, I I'm happy to listen to the entire oeuvre. Everything that they ever made is something I would gladly listen to. The albums I just listed there are just my favorite albums of them. But yeah, I loved all those these things. Um, recently, it's kind of like music is a weird spot, right? Because we don't really have albums. It's almost impossible to go in. Like I don't know, you don't really go to a store to buy a CD. I don't even have stuff that plays a CD anymore. So it's kind of like not really possible to buy albums. Everything is streaming now. Um, so yeah, if I listen to music uh, during my work, uh, my go-to things are, <laughs> this is a bit embarrassing, lo-fi hip-hop beats to study to. <laughs> it's like an all-time classic. Uh, and uh, also there's like a playlist that I like to listen to by a channel called Beyond Skies. Um, it's called uh, Japanese Deep House. There's like four volumes of it and it's really good deep house music that I really like to listen to while working. Cheese26 asks, this has probably been asked before, but how do I overcome a massive creative drought when you encounter it? Uh, that's a very open question. It depends on the kind of creative drought that you're experiencing. Like, is it that you are in the middle of development and you feel like you're stuck and, and you don't have the motivation to continue? That's a type of creative drought, I guess. And another one is like, if you don't know what to do in the first place. Uh, that's a different type of uh, challenge, right? Um, I did make a video about this. Um, it's called uh, We Are All Game Beginners, and maybe that will help you out. But I have to say, uh, recently I don't have that much problems with this. Uh, usually the problem I have is I want to uh, work on games, but I don't have the time. Paul asks, um, is it worth working in the games industry to learn the craft, or can you study by yourself while working uh, on another job which teaches similar skills? Oh man, it, it really depends. It really depends. I would generally, I would say it's probably better to work in an industry, but also the industry is not a great place to work on. So it really depends on what kind of job you can get in the industry. I think there's like smaller studios or if, you, if the people that you work with are people that you like, 
um, that's the that's probably a better place to to work on games than um, than like a you know big studio and so forth. But there's like you know there's good reason to work in a big studio. You get to work on big projects. You learn you know cutting edge pipelines and so forth. So I don't know. It really depends. It really depends on where you are, where you want to go with your career. Xiong Zi asks, what inspires and motivates you to share your knowledge with the Pico8 community? What's your profession? You give off a great and fun lecture vibe. Yes, I'm teaching um, game design and game programming at various universities and uh, institutes in uh, Cologne and Bonn as well. So uh, yeah, that, that's what I do. And this channel here is kind of like a side job, which became my main job in the last three years. Um, because I was in China and I couldn't do my other teaching. Uh, Ari Dos Retro asks, what do you feel is, was your most ambitious project with Pico 8? What is your favorite project that you started, finished? Uh, Pico or not Pico, anything you've done that you like the most? Um, most ambitious project is uh, pork-like probably, because that just took such a long time. Uh, and also, and like finishing it was so hard. Again, I made a video about this. We are all game beginners. And also the current Schmup project is also probably the longest I spent on a game. It, and I really want to finish soon. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to finish. It's just like, it's a, it's a huge undertaking. Documenting everything along the way was um, really slowed down the project uh, tremendously. Uh, but we're getting to a good place. Uh, favorite project I worked on? Uh, I think My Chance Sweet Buns was the most fun. I, I don't know. It's just like it came out of me just like this. And uh, yeah, I, it's it's just like one month and I still look back fondly on My Chance Sweet Buns. It's really great. I, I mean, it's a all around positive project. Uh, Smelly Fish Sticks, do you have any fun ideas for a score sub when it comes out? And do you foresee any relatively minor API like Oval being added or think it's pretty much set? Oh man, uh, I just want score sub to come out. That's my only <laughs> wish for score sub because it's been, <laughs> it's been 84 years. <laughs> I uh, as for changes, things I would like to um, f to be expanded on the API. I mean, I've been critical about the way you draw rectangles in Pico 8. I don't like that, that you have to define two points. It would be nice if it was one point and width and height. Uh, it would be nice if we had rectangle two, rect two, <laughs> rect fill two, that just does it differently. But I, I think that that probably wouldn't do that because it, it would make the API really bloated, I think. Um, one thing that would be nice if split uh, could work on two-dimensional arrays because I always have to program uh, split 2D in my programs and that always takes a chunk of uh, tokens. Not too much tokens, but some tokens. So it would be nice if you could just like uh, split a string into a two-dimensional array or multi-dimensional arrays. Uh, all right, so here's a bunch of short questions. Here's by a question by N8P275. How did you make your crazy cool Denglish audio? That was fun. Um, that was just Google Translate. I said it to German, and then there's like little speaker symbol that you that you <laughs> that you click on, and it will, you know, just read out the text that is in the box in that language. And so if you put English text in the German box and then let the German language voice synthesizer speak it out, then you get that that English uh, Denglish audio. Jack X asks, uh, I would like to, you to talk to German for a bit. Hab dich noch nie Deutsch reden hören? Yeah, tut mir leid, es ist ein bisschen blöd. Und ich habe mir da so ein bisschen Gedanken drüber gemacht. Es ist ein bisschen schwierig, weil ähm, der Kanal ist in Englisch, damit ich mehr Leute erreichen kann, weil damit mehr Leute die Videos schauen können. Äh, ich könnte den Kanal auf Deutsch machen, aber dann würde ich würde viel weniger Leute zuschauen. Und das ist ein kleines Problem. Uh, Tenor B1475, do you ever make horror games? I would love to. I love horror games. Um, they are, they very much rely on production values and mood. And it's, I think it's tough to make horror games in Pico 8 because it's just so lo-fi, right? It's just, you can see that it's so abstract. So you, it's difficult to get in the mood. Uh, I did kind of make a creepy game, not really a horror game, but it's a bit creepy, unsettling. And it's called Trauma and it is on Steam. It is an old game, but I'm, I'm still proud of Trauma. Pico8 Gamer asked a whole bunch of questions. I'm not going to answer all of them because some of them are already answered in other situations, but uh, I picked out two questions that they asked. Uh, will any games have a sequel that you have done? Uh, so if I'm going to make any sequels to any of my games, yes. Um, I would love to. I would love to make a sequel to Pork Like, but on a different platform. Um, do you think it's better to learn and then try or better to jump in and make mistakes while learning? Uh, definitely better to learn while doing. I think that's how you learn, by doing. You don't learn by reading books. The books can help, 
but you don't learn by reading the books. <laughs> All right, so a whole bunch of questions were asking about the future of the channel and what I'm going to do in the future. Completely understandable. Um, Kaiser Kaiser, for example, such a great username. Will you make a non-Pico8 tutorial game dev series in the future? Maybe Tick80 or another open source? A similar question by Rewind. Uh, I'd like to see your fantasy console cheat list. We all know Pico8 is your true love. But if you could create a cheat list of three dev engines you were allowed to use, and Pico 8 wouldn't consider it uh, cheating. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't have that kind of loyalty towards Pico 8. I'm fine using other engines. It's it's fine. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about maybe doing some other engines in the future. Um, Picotron, obviously, when it com comes out, I definitely will get into Picotron. Um, but I was also recently, especially recently, I was thinking about doing Lua Love because it's kind of like a very, it's like a big boy engine and it's like a very logical step stop going from Pico 8 because it also uses Lua. Also, I, I do a lot of processing, so doing processing would be nice. Also, maybe Arduino, which is also kind of like processing related, would be also fun. Uh, some kind of Arduino projects like this one. <laughs> this is an arcade button that I just recently did. It's an arcade button that you can press and it hooks up to USB and it's actually an actual keyboard. So <laughs> you can, this can be mapped to any keyboard. So you can do screenshots and so forth with the, with the button. Um, yeah, so Arduino would be fun too. Tick80 is also definitely on the table, although I kind of like uh, cooled down a little bit on Tick80. I was definitely planning to go on Tick80 in the past. This time, I'm not really sure if I will do that because there's just so many other engines that come out like um, Picotron and so forth. And also it got really quiet around Tick80. -tick I'm not sure what's happening there. I don't know. Maybe I have to, maybe it's just like, you know, I lost connection to that community, but um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just have to look a little bit more closer. Do not eat my Xilla. <laughs> Do not eat my Xilla. <laughs> Do you plan to make a Picotron content once it releases? With how Picotron will be modular and allow you to make your own applications to aid your development, it feels like it would fit perfectly with your approach to making games, i.e. Path Brain Editor for advanced map and tools like Memslore. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that's why I'm one of the reasons why I'm super hyped. There's not just me, but a lot of people are making tools in Pico 8, and Picotron will totally feed into that, would kind of allow us to create like a whole set of tools that you can use to make games in Picotron if everything goes according to plan. So yeah, that seems very exciting to me, yeah. Kintama asks, uh, will you get into 3D in Pico 8 or wait until Lexalafel releases this, his new one? I guess that means Picotron. Could we see a 2D scaling for 3D game like Atari Lynx Warbirds in the future? Think racing, space shooter, Doom, or Quake. Also, reality, uh, really interested in doing a dungeon crawler with skill tree assignable character attributes and of course, juicy effects. Um, yes, I'm thinking of actually doing a 3D uh, a small like a 3D tutorial series, like not a long one where we make a whole game, but just like like a small uh, proof of concept thing. Um, I wanted to do that previously already. I did like a one day of research and, and it turns out we weren't there yet. So I wanted to do a Mario Kart, like a mode seven kind of plane that you can uh, drive across. Uh, it's back when I tried it, that was shortly after T-Line came out. And back when I tried it, the map was too small. The pixels would be too big. So it didn't look like Mario Kart. It looked like as if you were, were, you were driving across like huge rectangles. Or you made the entire level smaller. Then you get like a reasonable resolution on the, on the texture. But then the racing track was too small. It wouldn't look like Mario Kart. It would just like be going in a small circle. Um, so I kind of abandoned that, that approach. Um, but now we got like the expanded memory space where you can put a bigger map in the expanded memory space. And I think now I'm eager to try out if now making a level that is big enough for like a Mario Kart kind of racing track at a reasonable texture resolution, if, if that's possible now. I still need to try it out. And if it works, I would love to make a tutorial about that. Otherwise, I think doing something like uh, Wolfenstein would be also fine. Um, as for doing a dungeon crawler with a skill tree, ah, uh, that's what technically, <laughs> I mean, pork like is as far as that will go, I think. I, I think Pico 8 doesn't lend itself to this kind of like <clears throat> uh, feature bloat, I feel. Because if you have a skill tree, then you also have to make all those skills and those cost tokens and those tokens then won't be available to make interesting gameplay. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's a good... And also there's like UI involved because you have to make a UI to do the skill tree. So I don't know. Uh, I feel like there's just not a lot of space to maneuver there for PQ8. So I probably won't do something like this. Uh, I'd rather focus on something that really plays very well 
and and expand that as far as I can rather than to have this idea that I have to make a skill tree and then create a game that supports the skill tree, you know. Judge Groovy Man asks, running Pico 8 on a bare metal or as close as possible is something I would love to hear more about. I think this is as bare metal as it gets. I would, I would love to for somebody actually to, uh, if somebody knows about Linux and so forth, I would love somebody to make a stripped down operating system that just straight up boots into Pico 8 and has nothing else. <laughs> that would be so great. I would definitely install that on my RGB 30 and not use the RGB 30 to play any other games. I would play all the other emulation stuff on on uh, Mio Mini, probably. Uh, so yeah, I think these emulation handhelds are as close to bare metal as you get with Pico 8. Um, otherwise, I think if you want to get bare metal, uh, you probably want to have Arduino, like the Ar Ardu Boy. Ardu Boy would be also something that I might do a tutorial about, which is like, I don't, I have it in my drawer. I didn't, didn't get it out. It's a little, little small Game Boy-like device that is Arduino based. It has a tiny little uh, black and white uh, OLED screen and you program it in Arduino itself. And it's really nice because it's kind of, kind of like, um, uh, it feels very Game Boy-like uh, in a sense that it's very made for taking with you very small games, kind of like a fantasy console that is hardware-based, so to speak. Butchered Possum asks, if you haven't already, could you make a video about maximizing every single uh, recourse, resource, I guess, in Pico 8, like for example, using the entire map uh, sheet and sprite sheet. <laughs> <laughs> maximizing every single resource is, <laughs> is a tall ask. Um, the thing is like optimizing and maximizing stuff is, is really, so it, that doesn't really make sense in, in a broad uh, sense. Uh, it's something that always um, has to happen in the context of making a very specific game. So for example, if you make a map, uh, you can like a game that you had that has a map that you can walk around it. Um, you can get more bang for your buck and if you compress that map somehow and that's and you can make certain assumptions in the gameplay that will allow you to compress the map more um and that's the kind of optimization that you often do like you have a very specific use case and that use case allows you to optimize things harder right just making broad videos about optimizations i don't think it's that useful although i have to say i was thinking about maybe doing like a, a crash course in uh uh, token optimization because there are certain opt co token optimization techniques that are very common and just doing like a video that summarizes all of them would be maybe fun. Michael White asks, hi, just wondering if you ever plan to make a metrovania like a game tutorial in the future. I'm still working through the shmup tutorial. I'm loving it. Thanks, Michael. Also, Trock asks, my questions, once the advanced shmup tutorial series finishes, what is are the next game genres you'd like to do tutorials for? Platform, adventure, RPG. Also, do you think next series, whatever it may be, will be back to beginner-focused version or a continuation of the more advanced tutorials? Yeah, so these are two questions about what we're going to do next. I will probably do as like a survey once once it's time uh, where I will ask what people are more interested in. I have some ideas. Metro Devenia is definitely on the table. Um, I'm definitely thinking about that a lot. Uh, also, maybe something like a top-down adventure, like a Zelda or like a Final Fantasy adventure. Um, also thinking a lot about this. Um, maybe something else. I, I, I kind of want to finish the shmup first, and then I'm going to have to think about what, what we're going to do next. Um, there's multiple options and I'm open to suggestions. Uh, as for whether it's going to be beginner focused or a continuation, uh, at this point probably no longer beginner focused because I feel like I got discovered. I had like the shmup tutorial, which I think is a really good entry. There is also the breakout tutorial, so I probably will do a little bit more advanced. Maybe not quite as advanced as the advanced shmup tutorial series, but um, yeah, generally it's for somebody who's already making Pico 8 or somebody who at least who knows how to program. Yes, and these are all of the questions. Thank you so much for asking the questions. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. It was a great pleasure. I'm really happy about the 14,000 subscribers. And also I wanted to give a big shout out and a big thank you to all the people who are supporting me on coffee.com. Thank you so much for your support, big deal. Uh, obviously, we're gonna talk to each other in a, in a week or so when I do the lazy devlog. And for all of you other people out there, if you like uh, this type of video where I can talk a little bit about my work and, and the things I'm thinking about, uh, then, uh, uh, coffee.com slash lazydev is a good place because I do a weekly lazydev vlog where I can do these kinds of videos where I just sit around and talk. Right, so um, just to give you an idea, um, the next couple of videos are going to be some interview videos with Shmup developers. Uh, I've recorded them, prepared them, that's one of the reasons why I did such a big break. This and the hardware review. 
Um, so we're gonna do the uh, Schwab developer videos next, the interviews. And meanwhile, I will continue working on the Schmap tutorial series. I'm looking forward to finish this finally, I, I, but we're getting to a really good, really good place with that. So, uh, so this is gonna be really cool. Thank you again so much for, um, for your questions. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Where, oh yeah, by the way, when are we going to do the next Q&A? Um, so we did one at 7,000. We now we did one at 14,000. So it makes sense that the next one is gonna be at 28,000. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.